thank you. Um, first of all, I am I am actually standing in for my co-author. My name is uh, Sadasivan Shankar, and I am involved in leading some of the efforts on materials modeling, computational materials within the technology and manufacturing group in Intel. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So I am standing in for uh, Ralph Cavan, and he had a family emergency. So this was a joint piece of work. So I'm not sure I will completely represent all Calvin, Calvin's perspectives, but I will certainly try to do my best. Um, and thanks to J Jeff and others for inviting me. I thought that when I, this talk was scheduled in Berkeley that I should not wear a tie because I thought people get stoned in Berkeley if you wear a tie. But then I came in and saw all the professors and everyone wearing a tie. So sorry for not uh, dressing to the occasion, but I hope <laughs> you, the talk will make up for the loss of formality. Uh, so with that said, a Carnot bound for general purpose information processes is what I'm going to talk about. So this is like a question being was posed to Schrodinger when he started on quantum mechanics, that if you talk of wave equations, if you talk of waves, then where is your wave equation? That was a question that was posed to him when he started on it, because before that, the electron duality was accounted for. Similarly, if you're talking about energy, where is the thermodynamics? So maybe this talk will look at it from a thermodynamic perspective of some of the things. This builds on some previous work that Ralph, Ralph and Victor have worked on. And I'm just going to add to that with some new work that we have been working with them for some time. So the main points of this talk, I don't know why the screen it's getting cut off. Uh, is there a, the screen? Some of the title gets cut off here. Yeah? Need to change the resolution on your display. Oh, okay. The screen is actually cut off there, so. <laughs> There's your problem. <laughs> You know, I was extracted from my work and asked to give the presentation, so please. <laughs> I was in the middle of quite a few things there. <laughs> As you can see. Is this the one? No, the, the first one, the first one, right. right. Okay. So let's start. Thank you. Uh, so the main points of this talk is that energy power minimization is the macro constraint that we are all working with from an architecture perspective. There are many new directions, as Professor Cheming who talked to some of them, new materials, new devices, and new topologies. And there is also this functional diversification whereby you could integrate more diversified functional materials into the chip. But how is the maximum computational performance related to device physics? That's the question, that's the context of this talk. Architecture and software need consideration to enable right scaling. So within the ITRS, a working group was formed to essentially address this key complementary components. So the thermodynamics of computation at system level is a more systematic way to look at those aspects which we are not typically used to looking at. And the main piece of this work is a new methodology based on statistical physics and quantum mechanics have been developed for addressing the thermodynamics of switching-based systems. That's the basic premise. So with that said, the outline of the talk is as follows. The first part is what? What is the basic goal that we are trying to address? Uh, the second part is why the context of power versus MIPS, and this will kind of give you a little bit of a rationale of why this needs to be done but it's more obvious to the people here, so I will probably rush through some of those slides, which I'll be glad to talk to you offline. How, which is a new part of the methodology that we are presenting for one of the first times, is the methodology used in the analysis. Now, the last part of this is where are we going with it? That is, that is, that is where I would end it with. So the fundamental limits of information engines is essentially the point that the discipline of thermodynamics set off the entire heat engine and the industrial revolution. In 1824, when Sadi Carnot formulated the principles of the engine, it 
people thought this is so theoretical, but Sadi Karna was not a physicist, he was an engineer. And he tried to see that different engines were not able to, you were not able to increase the efficiency. And he put it in his treatise. And that was the first basis of the second law of thermodynamics. So that concept is, can we try to extend such a concept to car nose engine to computing? That is the question we are asking. So let's look at it from a system reliability perspective. The current approach is system reliability is done through device reliability. All end devices in the logic systems need to operate correctly. I mean, this is an unusually harsh constraint, but, but a constraint that's taken very seriously. And it requires that all ideal devices may not end with the ideal system. So the point of that is maybe there's a local optimization that you would be able to do in order to have certain devices working differently. That, and hence, a global system optimization may be more optimal from an energetics than a locally optimized, every, every bit optimized system. So the fundamental premise of this is the heat engine takes the heat energy and converts part of it into mechanical work. That part is what determines the thermodynamic efficiency of a heat engine. Now, if you were to extract yourself out from the chip mode and try to look at the entire computing, you essentially get electromagnetic energy into it. And then you have the heat generation, which all of us know when our laps get warmer with these laptops. Then you essentially have the digital computation, which is an electromagnetic energy component, and information processing gets done. So one could postulate that there could be a computing engine similar to a heat engine. But immediately, many problems come to mind. In fact, people argue these concepts, which are all valid. First of all, Carnot's engine essentially means that there is an efficiency peak that you cannot essentially go beyond a certain limit. While in computing, there is no engine involved, and you can go as high as you want because you can give more and more energy. That's one argument. The second argument that I hear from some of the architects is, we never look at it from this perspective. We look at it only power. We don't look at it energy. Energy is a conser conservation quantity, and power is the energy per unit time. But people are more used to working with power, and hence energy is not the, uh, is the right, uh, right variable. And the third thing is, people have told me that they may, such a connection may not exist, and such an engine may not be, that you can look at it ideal example which are valid points, and I hope that I will address two out of those three points uh, in this talk. So now, if you were to just look at what I showed you from the energy, thermodynamics is a study of energy transformation of properties common to all systems, and the goal is to use thermodynamic to incorporate relations between components and the overall energy. That's, that's a key, key aspect of it. So start off with the previous work that Victor Zernoff and Ralph had worked on, and I will kind of walk you through the why of this, the rationale behind it. Now, if you were to look at it on the x-axis are the MITs, which are essentially the maximum binary throughput bits that you could essentially estimate, given the transistor and how many transistors are laid out. On the y-axis are the MIPS, which essentially this has been taken, Victor tells me, from the Intel microprocessor quick reference guy. And if you look at that, you essentially see most of the processor data, how they fall on. Essentially, they fall on this particular curve. Okay? So there is a bits. So bits is what happens at the transistor level. MIPS is what you see at the performance level. There seem to be a strong empirical relation. Okay? Now, if you look at it from a computing power perspective, you essentially see that the MIPS to the bit that I showed, you essentially have the single core and dual cores essentially starting to give you more MIPS per bit. So you are essentially starting to see a slight uptick due to multi-cores versus single core. Now, this relation, if you were to fit a, a, a logarithmic, it's a logarithmic plot, you essentially get some constants which shows you how this curve is essentially based. So in other words, if you know a switching transistor, it seems to say that you could estimate the MIPS out of it, which is a powerful empirical observation. Now, is there a relation between watt and MIPS, which we all know there does seem to be such a relationship, and the power law is given for that also, which essentially follows something similar to that, which you could estimate. 
which essentially has been captured in this particular slide is that there is a functional relationship between the technology capability defined and the maximum number of binary transitions. So MIPS is technology, binary transitions is what you get bottom up. So top and bottom, there seem to be a good relation. And there also seems to be a an approximately similar looking functional relationship for the power. And the key is to increase the MIPS without necessarily increasing the power. That's a challenge. And that is what brings us to this particular aspect of the problem. On the right hand side at the bits level, it is essentially determined by statistical mechanics. You saw the Boltzmann distribution when Professor Hu was talking and the quantum mechanics, which essentially says how close you could bring the two source and drain together before the tunneling starts to happen. There's also the tunneling part. There is also the energy containment part. Because quantum mechanically, there are zero point energies that you cannot have systems with zero energy. So if you bring everything very close together, they essentially end up with higher energy. So that determines the lower end of the energy. The that is what the bits part. The MIPS part, more on the Alan Turing machine, uh, which essentially is the instructions per second is a measure of the computational capability. So theoretically, can we correlate the two? That, that is the question that, uh, that was set to ask. And I will probably not go into this detail, but the computational theory is, can we use that? So let's look at what actually happens in the switching. So if you look at a nanoscale device, on the left-hand side, you essentially have a quantum well with a single particle in it. And if on the right-hand side, when you essentially put a barrier to it, you essentially make a bit out of it. So what you have done is essentially from a no bit, you have essentially brought in a bit, an actual binary device. And that is the nanoscale device at its ideal limit. So we think that all the devices operate in an equilibrium with the thermal environment. We know that. You can have the switching faster, but the whole thing needs to be in a thermodynamic equilibrium. And now if you continue this, I will spare you the math, but just the key, the key messages, I will kind of talk you to this, talk you through that. On the left-hand side, if you use the statistical limits of that with, with just the switching, you get the minimum energy as 3 kBT log 2. I mean, it's an order of kBT log 2. Whether it's 3 or 2, we can discuss that, but it's an order of kB log 2. And many people have arrived at the same estimate, and this is the minimum energy need for a, needed for a binary device. There's no question to that. On the right-hand side, however, we can't reach that energy, and that's because of quantum mechanics. Here, you don't necessarily need quantum mechanics. You need statistical mechanics. But on the right-hand side, the quantum mechanics essentially limits how close you could bring the things together. And that essentially limits it of the order of 1.5 nanometers before the quantum mechanics essentially says you cannot contain particles. Uh, here, electron was used as the estimate of that. So this is essentially a plot. I, George was involved in it. And the key point is this is to plot the gate or the dimension, that, sim that small dimension I showed on the x-axis. And the y-axis has switching energy and the gate delay. If you look at all the devices that have come out from Intel, they are all clustered together in the top right. If you look at the limit, which I showed you as 3 kBT or kBT log 2, it's on the bottom left. So if you look at the smallest device, theoretically possible, you are on the lower limit. If you look at it, the real devices, they are of the order of 10,000 kBT. So there is a big gap in there. So there could be an opportunity of how to get there, and that is one of the goals of it. But then the question, which is a logical question, is why are we at 10,000 kBT now then? If we can get down to this level, why can't we get to it now? And the next few slides kind of talk through this. I know it, it looks like a lot of equations, but I will try to explain the physics of it as we go along. If we continue the same digital switch, ideal switch that I explained to you about, you essentially come up with that the energy needed is kBT joules over the tile. Tile stands for the critical dimension A. Okay? And if you continue that, you essentially find out that a device density, an ideal device density could be 1 over 8A squared. That is the maximum that you could get. 
ITRS says that it's 1 over 20A squared. So we are essentially packing fewer devices than ideally possible. So the first clue is why we are not as high is possibly because our packing is not high enough. That is one possible reason. Now if you look at it, this is a plot of the channel length that I showed. And then on the y-axis is the number of electrons on the left-hand side. And on the right-hand side, it is the energy per kT. So if you look at it, when the channel length goes smaller and smaller, you need fewer and fewer electrons to switch. When you go to channel lengths of 15 and 20, you are essentially finding out that you need more and more electrons to switch, and your energy is quickly going higher and higher. So the, the sheer fact that you need more electrons to switch and they need to travel far seems to be essentially saying that you are moving away from the ideal efficient system. And then this explanation says if you ha assume a fan out, different fan outs, FO stands for fan outs, you essentially see that the KBT <coughs> continues to increase. On the long interconnect, it's like 1.33. In the minimum interconnect, it's about 1.18. So it essentially shows you the range due to the interconnects. And you can comprehend the interconnect tiles and do the same analysis through that. And you essentially come up with the fact that if you use a switch with interconnect, first thing, the 3K EBKT log 2 I showed you was for a single switch. If I put the interconnects on top of it, I end up with 9KBT. So already I have moved away. Just the fact that I need to connect the two devices is bringing in a sense of inefficiency. And then you can calculate the minimum switching time, and I will not go into a detail. So now, what can you do with it? The thing you can do with that is you could essentially take it to the arithmetic logical unit and try to apply the same principles. And essentially, you could, you could build this up based on Jan Rabe's work. Victor has put together this part of it is essentially using these four operations, you could essentially come up with how many devices are in this particular ALU. And you essentially find out that there are about 98 devices needed for a single floating point bit operation. Okay, I will not go into the details, but if you just look through the numbers, it adds up to three for AND, three for OR gates, 27 for AD, and another two for NOT, and 27 for AD. And then there's a 33 for multiplexing. And essentially, if you bring all that together with an R at the, at the output, you get about 98 devices, and your energy is already into the 98 kBT. So our operations are introducing some inefficiency to the single switch. But there are no surprises here. All we are doing is quantifying that. So now, given that, we looked at a little bit of thermodynamics and a little bit of quantum. But how will we do it to a real device? I think I just showed you a little bit about the arithmetic logical unit, but then we can try to get it into how to do it for more generic devices. And that is a new part of the work that I will talk to in the next two sections. So here, our intent is to essentially look into a binary switch basics again before I set it up so that you will see where I am building this up to. This is a binary switch. You have particle on one side, this is off, and if it goes there, it's on. That's what the switching process is. You essentially can have it going both ways. And you can, so if you were to assume this, then you come up with some length parameters, some energy parameters, and a charge parameter. You come up with this. So this is the fundamental. Now, if you were to, if you were to look at a more complex device, the same device that I have, I'm showing the planar view of it, you can try to put it together in a bigger, bigger architecture or a bigger uh, unit, like what I have shown here. And then you see that the device has certain characteristics in 2D plane. The length unit has a fewer number of cells, and the width has a number of minimum cells needed. And you can actually see that. Any device has a length, planar, and a width. So if you were to relax the assumption how they have been calculated, you can essentially try to lay out switches in, in the following manner. On the top left, you see a single switch, then two switches connected, the drains connected together, you could argue, and then there are four switches here, seven switches, and 12 switches. Okay. These switches 
lead to a layout inefficiency. And the layout inefficiency is mainly caused because you cannot have the devices shorting each other. They need to be in a certain configuration with each other. And if you look at the fundamental formula that drives this geometrical scaling, it essentially is written here. It is the number on the width and the number on the cell added by some of the adjacent layers to keep them isolated. You essentially come up with a number, number density as one over alpha a squared. So if I showed you the single switch, you come up with the eight a squared, which I showed you first. That's the ideal case. But if I put two switches in, I'm getting a 12 a squared. So I'm not getting the total scale up. The two switches being put together is essentially different. But if I put four switches together, I am not getting 32. I'm getting only 20. So I have already dropped in efficiency when I stack four switches together. And when I go to 12, it is 36. So you can see how the efficiency of switch stacking is actually bringing it down. Okay. Now, let us try to look at some realistic switches, how this would translate to it. There is an inverter, a NOR, a NAND, and an SRAM. And if you apply the same principle of scaling that I showed you, you will get the following configuration for the layouts. And this essentially comes down to these numbers. An inverter layout efficiency is like 1 over 12a squared. Remember, 1 over 8a squared is ideal. 1 over 12a squared, and NOR is 1 over 24a squared. A NAND is 1 over 16a squared, and a 60SRAM is 1 over 48a squared. Now, if you look at the minimum, it is 1 over 8a squared. And the ITRS has said it's 1 over 20a squared. So essentially, you see that between the devices we have looked at, the SRAM is the least efficient in terms of stacking efficiency. And then the inverter is probably the most efficient. So it kind of tells you the geometrical constraints of the devices. Now, the beauty of this formula that I showed is you can extend it into 3D, 3D tiling, and essentially look at the geometry of 3D. Now, what do we do with it, and how do we take it to the next step? We got this layout efficiency, but how do you get to the thermodynamics? So the thermodynamics, it essentially runs on the following basic premise. I have summarized here, you know, multi maybe like a one hour presentation into the next few slides. So please bear with me as I try to clarify it because I'm trying to put thermodynamics and information processing into four slides. So that's how this will turn out. So the switches, if I make the following four assumptions, switches are operating at quantum limits while the macro system is thermodynamic. Each switch is quantum, but the whole thing is immersed in a thermodynamic bath. Macro system is in thermo thermodynamic equilibrium, which means it's a canonical ensemble. Sure. And the micro systems are thermodynamically represented by average energy. And then the probability is determined by the number of nits. I call it nits, not bits, because I can have, I don't necessarily have to have a binary bit. And this is what I, I meant by nit. When nit is equal to 1, you have no switching. When nit is equal to 2, you have the binary switching. When you have 3, you have a 3-nit switching. And 4 is essentially 2-bit switching and so on. So you could essentially extend this and make the whole switching as part of that system that I mentioned to you about. Immerse it in an ensemble with multi-bit switching into it. This is conceptually, just, just bear with me as I go through that. Then you go through this enormous amount of math, and then you come up with these equations, OK? Uh, I showed you only the equations which you can see in the textbook, because I will show you the final result of using this basic equations to estimate the thermodynamic efficiency. So I used the original Boltzmann-Planck equation, which is used for entropy the probability that comes out of statistical mechanics, and then the system-free energy, which comes from thermodynamics, and the quantum device at the very bottom, which I mentioned to you about was the basic. If you put it all together, what do you get with the switch? This is the entropy you get. So the entropy of this whole system of switches, average entropy, comes out to be this. Let me explain the second equation. First and second are equivalent. The second equation is easier to explain. The entropy is given by the total energy of the system 
with minus the switching energy plus the quantum state okay and the switching state both of that need energy and both of that contribute to entropy okay now if you were to look at this for a minute the kb log 2 for entropy which is landover formalism and you know people have dealt with in enormous detail falls out of it if you assume that there is only one state and it's not a quantum state if it's a classical state you get a kb log 2 out of it and if you assume there is no switching energy these two fall off and you essentially get the entropy as the basic limit that people are used to seeing in textbooks now if i took that and then applied it to these real systems, I'm coming up with the minimum energy that a binary is a KT log two for a classical switch. And then for a 60 SRAM, I'm coming up with 16 KT log two, okay? And that is, gives you an idea of how we are able to estimate the energy of these systems. So now what do we do with it? I am summarizing it now. That I believe that we have developed a general methodology for applying thermodynamic principles for information engines like Carnot, Carnot principle. I am not saying it's a Carnot engine, but I'm saying the principles are same and we are going to end up with an ideal computing engine. I strongly believe in that. The two applications of this is, people, before I get into the applications, people are more used to using simplistic capacitance-based estimates of energy. That was okay, but as I said, you know, if you're talking about energy, where is the thermodynamics? And this is where essentially it brings that part in. So two applications are similar to heat engines. We will identify the ideal compute engine. I will call it Carnot's compute engine because of lack of a better word for it. But Carnot engine brings people out of the woods arguing about this is not Carnot's engine. And I, I, some of those points are valid. We can evaluate ther theoretical efficiencies of different architectures, just like an internal combustion engine versus a diesel engine, all measure themselves with respect to the Carnot's engine. We believe we can measure that. And this can also be used to tie into the biological computation where the brain that we all use a lot appears to operate at a device switching energy of a few hundred kT. So brain is a lot more efficient than the, than the microprocessor. But this shouldn't surprise to the microprocessing designers. They know that. They never worried about the energy till very recently when you started capping on the power. And then the continuing work is estimating entropies of simple systems and include dissipation and estimate available energy. With that, I'll kind of say one more example. We t <laughs> the functional diversification is a big thing. And we believe that we can use this to prove the point that you could integrate more energy efficient ecosystem around the chip. I know it's a slightly a newer concept, but there are a lot of new materials coming in. One of the collaborations we are trying to do is with Jeff Grossman, I don't know whether Jeff is uh, in the room or not, in Berkeley, where we are trying to estimate, see whether there are materials that you could integrate in which you could recover the energy and reuse it locally. So that functional diversification could essentially make it operate better. So that's all I have. Thanks. Very good. Uh, we have time for maybe one question, even though it's a very provocative uh, talk. Uh, I, after re listening to this, I'm still left uh, with what has changed. Landauer's paper was 1961, and, and in 50 years, uh, we have maybe added a few more constants to KT log 2. But what fundamentally has changed, it, you know, I don't want you to go through the whole talk again, no, no, but. No. <laughs> <laughs> but the question is a loaded question. Uh, because you, you, you quoted 1960, so 40 years, uh, <laughs> for 50 years. Uh, so, so what has changed is something substantially. Two things have changed. La Landor spent enormous time on reversible computing and, you know, Bennett and all that. I have gone through that whole literature. They don't, I mean, some versions of those papers do. They don't look at the quantum limitations as one. They don't look at the system limitations at the other end. They talk of single switch and very small reversible switching. But we are looking at an entire architecture. So what I didn't show, because of lack of time, Jeff sensitized me before the meeting, 
uh, is that we can extend this to totally an architecture and estimate the whole entropy of an architecture. That has not been done by Landauer. Nobody has done that. Okay, so thanks very much.